We're good to go, you think? Okay. All right. All right, I'll get started. Good evening, everyone. I'm Mike Cummings, Superintendent of Schools in Fairfield, and I welcome you to our um, conversation tonight about the remote learning model. We're going to break this into two uh, different pieces, as we've discussed and, and uh, let you know. So the first, first part will be 45 minutes looking at the K-8 model and answering questions around that. And then we're going to spend the last 45 minutes on the 9 to 12 model because there are some uh, important differences between the, the K-8 and the 9 to 12. So uh, we're going to show you, share with you some slides um, to talk about the model. And Andrew, if you are you sharing your screen? All right. So these are just a couple of quick slides. We want to spend the majority of our time together answering the questions you have. Colleen DC is with us again tonight to moderate. And I also have with us uh, Dr. Zakia Parrish, our Executive Director of Operations and Processes, Dr. James Savichancic, our Executive Director of Instruction, Curriculum, and Assessment, uh, Rob Mancusi, our Executive Director of Special Education and Special Programs. And uh, joining us as well is going to be Eileen Roxby, who is going to be leading the remote learning uh, model for K-8. Um, so just a couple pieces that I want to go over uh, before we get started. And I'm just watching the slides, waiting for them to catch up to me. So I'll we'll pause for a second here. Are those ready to go? Um, yeah, just give me one second here. Okay, thanks. Okay. All right, thank you. So just a couple points that we're gonna mention here about K-8 and, and if you're sticking around for 912, you're gonna hear them again. Uh, but I think there's a couple, these are important things to remember as we go forward. There's, uh, this is communication that those of you who've emailed me directly have heard me say, and those of you, and well, those of you who've received any of our um, group communications, we've emphasized these points. Uh, we're going to emphasize them again and again because, it, and these are most of these also apply to the hybrid learning um, as well. So let me get started. First, um, our intent in all of this work is that we will uh, we are listening to the concerns that come from our staff. Uh, our parents and eventually from our students and we are going to continue to work on improving that. Um, that is the work going forward. Um, when it comes to things like this, we are all really first year educators, our teachers, our staff, our administration. Um, nobody's done this work before. You are first time parents in this. You might be on your fifth kid and they're a senior in high school, but you've never had a year like this before. And we are going to be working through this together. Um, so when we're working through something like this together at the level of which we're working, and particularly in a school district this size with so many moving pieces, uh, the number one operation or the number one requirement we all have to bring to the table is patience. Um, we are prioritizing the social and emotional health of our students and our staff. I have told our teachers, and I'm going to be telling our teachers again, that the most important thing that they do is that they take care of the kids' well-being and they take care of their own well-being. There is, I'm sure for all of us, a lot of anxiety, worry, and concern with students coming back to school. Uh, we are absolutely committed to their safety and well-being, uh, but we are gonna be learning all the time as we go, and we are going to prioritize the learning around um, safety and welfare of everybody within the schools themselves. Um, we are going to be working on learning, but the priority first will become, the, again, the social uh, safety and well-being of our students and staff. Um, we have to respect the learning curves that our teachers are going to be going through. Um, even in the hybrid model, that is brand new instruction for them. Uh, teachers teaching remotely, it is brand new instruction for them. We may have done some of this in the spring, but it, as we've said to you all along, the feedback you gave us, the feedback that the teachers themselves identified 
um, during the course of the spring, we have worked hard to change the model of instruction. And that's going to take some time to um, build uh, steam and get moving. Um, and I, I have firmly aware of how committed our teachers are to doing a great job by the kids, but um, it's going to be some trial and error. And we've got to be, again, the operative word here is going to be patience with everybody as we go forward. Um, we are holding learning model changes until September 10th, as was communicated, um, which is next Wednesday. And we'll be talking further about that next week. So there'll be no swapping between now and September 10th between models. And finally, joining us tonight will be Eileen Roxby, who is the administrator of the K-8 program. So next slide, please. So just a couple of pieces, and we're going to answer as many questions as we can tonight uh, in the time remaining. But we are going to be having an orientation for students and families on the 8th, which is Tuesday. Um, teacher class lists are now posted in Infinite Campus. Um, we, I've had some emails from parents today not being able to find uh, that, and we've we've been responsive to those parents. If they're not able to find something, um, Dr. Zavachancic has been really quick to get back to people and let them know where that information can be found. Um, teachers will be sending out uh, Google Classroom links, um, and we're going to keep remote class groupings together. So if students are in remote learning, this is the group they're with while they're in remote learning. Um, I just want to make sure that people are aware of that, that that, um, that class will stay together. Um, we are emphasizing the core instruction. So we are talking about English language arts, math, science, and social studies. That is our priority in the first week. We are continuing to work around building the specials. I've had a number of suggestions from parents that uh, have said, what, you know, it would be great if the students who are in remote could um, function in the special classes or join their their classmates from their brick and mortar building for the specials. Um, it is a great idea. And unfortunately, it's not likely to happen. And the reason for this is complex, but relatively simple. We have 11 elementary schools. Each of those 11 elementary schools has its own unique uh, schedule. To now try and impose a 12th school, the Remote Learning Academy on top of that, and, and get all of those actual classes to line up so that students would be accessible for those specials at the same time is really an impossible feat. So we are working on how we're going to best provide the specialist instruction um, for students who are in remote learning academy. It's not going to happen in the first week. We're going to be working on that with the specialist teachers um, this week and next and building up um, for that to happen. So um, in the week of September 14th, with students in remote will be able to access weekly recorded lessons um, and students will be able to get feedback on the work they do. Uh, and that will be coming from their building-based specialists. So while they may not be in class with their classmates from the brick and mortar, they'll be working with the teachers from their brick and mortar schools. Middle school, again, orientation is on the 8th. Schedules are posted in an infinite campus. Uh, again, remote class groupings will be staying together for that as well. Core instruction is going to happen in English, language arts, math, science, social studies, and world languages. And um, support services will be provided for students during their study hall period. So um, students who uh, have IEPs or 504s and get accommodations, um, those, those will be happening during their study hall periods. For unified arts, physical education is going to happen two times a week. Uh, health will ha be happening in one of the four quarters, as it does now in the uh, physical building. Uh, individual and small group music lessons will be starting later in the month of September and additional remote um, UA classes. We're working on that, but we have to measure the staffing impact. Um, that's one of the things that we're currently working on across the board, how we're going to staff, um, how we can successfully staff with qualified instructors, all of the different needs of the, the school system. So with that said, if we have time now, we have time now for some questions and answers. And again, uh, Ms. DC will be um, fielding the questions through the chat. So we don't, we only have one question in the chat so far. Okay. Uh, and that question is, are, are students who are enrolled in the Remote Learning Academy going to be allowed to do after school sports? Okay. Yes, I imagine it's Kate. 
Well, I think the question right now, uh, the first question really is, what will after school sports consist of? At this point, uh, for um, the middle school intramurals program and the middle school programs, we are not uh, holding any after school um, sports. We're not holding right now after school in the in the hybrid model. We're holding off on starting any clubs and activities for now. Um, part of that is really driven by the health needs in the building, the need to clean the building, and the uh, concerns with mixing cohorts. We will be looking later in the month at both middle and high school how we can start to um, some of these clubs and activities, whether they're happening in person or they're happening virtually. So the next questions are about timing. Um, if, they, if someone has not received a teacher assignment, when should they be hearing something? And when will they get a Google class code? So uh, Dr. Parrish, should doctors have a chance? Like, I don't know which of you may want to answer that one. So there are updates happening within um, Infinite Campus, Campus, excuse me, on a regular basis. So um, our scheduling teams are working even this evening to make adjustments as we identify um, certified staff to be able to cover or to, to teach certain components. So we don't have an assignment at this point in time. Um, that assignment will be coming, will be forthcoming within the next day or two. Uh, definitely before the start of school, a lot of our teachers are starting to send out um, Google Meet or Google Classroom, excuse me, invitations or, or the, the invite code so that students and their families can start logging into their Google Classroom, see who their teachers are, um, start getting to know um, some of the things that they'll be covering within their class. So that those things will be happening over the course of the next few days into the weekend. And um, of course, launching next week on Tuesday with the orientation where you will have an opportunity to be greeted not only by um, your teachers, but also the um, program administrator, uh, Ms. Roxby. Thank you, Dr. Parrish. The next question is, um, is there a standard schedule for our, all RLA classes in elementary or is it decided teacher by teacher? I'll take that one. Um, so there is a standard schedule of hours of instruction and minutes uh, in the K-5 schedule. There may be slight variations depending on um, the need of the classroom, but the minutes would not change. The only variation uh, that's possible is if um, reading might be switched with writing, for example, um, or math, uh, but the standard day and the sample schedules are online and we do plan on um, following that. Obviously when the courses begin, um, Ms. Roxby might have to make some changes, um, but we are committed to the, the minutes that are or were written about um, earlier about the remote academy. It will not be based on um, teacher choice. They will have to follow the sequence. And a follow up to that, um, Dr. Zavajancic is, I think, two parts. Are there going to, is there going to be live instruction over video, that's, that's as always a question. And I think the follow-up to that is, is there gonna be one-on-one -on -one or small group instruction for students? So the, the simple answer to both of those questions is a yes. Um, we also don't want um, parents and families to think that students are going to have screen time from nine in the morning till three in the afternoon. So it is a combination of both of those scenarios. I'll just give an example of reading at this point. Um, there's an expectation that there's a whole class mini lesson K-5 um, for 10 to 15 minutes every day, followed by station rotations or small group instruction that the teachers will put students in. Um, and those could be 15 to 20 minutes uh, and they will cycle through um, for the whole week. So it's not that every student will have a small group every single day. They might have it two or three or four times a week, um, but it would really depend on what the mini lesson is and what the need is of those um, groups. Um, and then they would continue to go to writing and have a similar, there is a 10 or 15 minute mini lesson followed by small group instruction um, in math. There are a few times throughout the day that we have asynchronous instruction um, for number corner. Um, and there's also some intervention in office hours in there that children can use, obviously, to do some of their asynchronous work, as well as to have some individual time with their teacher if necessary. Thank you. 
So the next theme that I'm seeing is really about people who are students who are enrolled in the RLA and their ties to their homeschool. So what specifically is being done to tie them to their homeschool? And then um, even more specific than that, if Mr. Mancusi could speak to are students with um, IEPs going to be serviced by the same service providers that they have developed relationships with? So I don't James, do you want to go first on that? Sure. Um, so although it wasn't a complete pairing, you will see that some of the teachers that have been um, placed in the or, or are in the remote academy um, are teachers from the schools that the students are coming from. Others are not. So that's not a hundred percent, but some are in terms of connection to the home school. Um, beyond that, we are trying to work the specialists in so that there is a homeschool connection um, to the physical education teacher, the art teacher, um, and uh, have those lessons be delivered in the remote academy as well. No student has been uh, removed from either their infinite campus or other portals that they may use. Um, from their home school, so they're still that is still considered their school. Um, they will continue to get messages from their principals. They'll continue to get um, newsletters in terms of families and any communications of open houses or any other events that might be going on um, in the home school. Okay. Yeah. Hi, Rob Mancusi, um, special director. If I could just address the. Um, the services for students with disabilities. We do have a uh, special education staff assigned to the remote learning academy to service our students with disabilities enrolled in the remote learning academy. So services will be provided by the special ed staff and related service staff that are um, doing remote learning. So that means that your child will probably not get services from the special ed or related service provider from the home school unless um, one of the providers is from um, from your child's home school. Thank you. There's a question in the chat asking who are the uh, RLA teachers and are they teachers from our district? And the answer to that, I can I can answer that one. Um, and the answer to that is yes, they are teachers from Fairfield. Um, or people who have recently retired from Fairfield, even if they are not uh, weren't planning on returning this year until the uh, RLA opportunity presented itself. Um, so the next question, uh, this will go back to Dr. Zavichancic again, and folks are asking about music. Um, how is music going to work for the students who are in the RLA? How are, are they gonna be involved in the larger uh, performance aspects of the music program, what the lessons look like. So if you could walk us through that a little bit, that would be helpful. Sure. And, um, you know, the only thing I'll say before we begin is we are uh, working with the specials teachers at this point to make sure that the offerings are meaningful um, and obviously meet the needs of the students in the um, RLA. Students have obviously different tracks in the K-5 uh, music program. I think the specific question is about music lessons. There are also students in general music, which would mostly be asynchronous instruction. Um, but for those students in one of the performing arts, um, the music teachers did come up with a uh, plan earlier in the week where they can have some synchronous uh, lessons for the RLA and the hybrid students uh, that are obviously practicing the same instruments or skills. Um, those were 20 to 25 minutes long. They would have to be scheduled individually with the teacher at the home school uh, who is doing that. Um, and that's gonna take some work in terms of putting the puzzle together to see how the pieces fit together with our remote learning academy, as well as with our hybrid um, schedules particularly so that we're not um, removing kids from academic areas um, consistently and that we're, you know, maintaining our, our regular academic schedule as well as the music schedule. Okay. Um, Mr. Mancusi, can you tell us if there is going to be support staff available for the students in the RLA, such as counselors? 
There is going to be counselors, there's going to be special education teachers, there's going to be all related service providers. We're still obligated to implement the IEP goals and objectives in students' IEPs. We will be doing that remotely, but yes, all related services and special ed staff will be provided in the Remote Learning Academy. There's a series of questions in the chat about students being able to meet each other. Um, when will students be able to meet each other and what will that opportunity look like for them? Uh, I assume we're talking about virtually. Yes. So, um, you know, and I can uh, bring Ms. Roxby. She's joined us here today to uh, obviously elaborate on this because she, she's been working with orientations and so forth, but they're, um, Many of the teachers have already sent out the Google Classroom Meet, so that was the first step in getting students um, paired off both with their teacher and with their peers. So that's going to be obviously the first point of contact. And then, Ms. Roxby, if you want to talk about some of your plans. Yes, yeah, sure. I'm meeting with the uh, teachers tomorrow. Uh, we're going to be planning a um, an orientation, so you'll get more information about that. But uh, the beginning of our school year is really all about building relationships, and I think that's going to be part of what we're going to be able to do virtually. My feeling is that we are trying to build a school, and a school is about relationships. And so um, for me, that's probably the most important thing that we have to do right now since our students won't physically be with each other. Um, but we have to learn how to um, still communicate effectively and build those relationships through a computer screen. And um, I think our teachers are up for that. Um, we'll be doing some fun activities together as classrooms and um, and as a school. So you'll get more information about that at orientation. But I'm working with the teachers to develop that right now. We, we just started to get together. I just came on board a few days ago. So we are getting things ready. And um, you'll get more information next week after we have our full staff meeting. So Ms. Roxby, while we have you, um, why or when should a parent reach out to you directly with a concern? Um, what what would your role be there? I, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? I did not hear you. Yes, if a parent has a question, when ah. should they ask you the question? Or is there someone else that they should reach out to? I still, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't hear it's you. It's okay, can I'll come back that? to you. <laughs> <laughs> This is, I'm having technical difficulties. I'm moving. <laughs> okay. Hello. Hi. When should a parent, can you hear me, Eileen? I'm sorry. Go ahead, Colleen. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Nope. <laughs> yes, I can. <laughs> okay. When should a parent reach out to you with questions? Oh, anytime. Um, really, my email is eroxby at fairfieldschools.org. Um, and uh, really, you can email me at any time. You can also give me a call. Um, you can just call central office and they'll put you through to me. So we're really trying our best to um, be, communication is a huge part of what we're gonna be doing. Um, and for me, that's very important. Um, cause we have, we don't know each other and we have to get to know each other. And that, and that for me is a big deal, you know? So the more we talk, the better it will be. And, um, so this is how we're going to have to communicate. So the more we do it, the better it is going to be for everybody. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so the next question is, uh, about materials. And I wonder if Dr. Parrish can answer this one. Are materials going to go home, going to go home with students? Um, are they going to get books? Are they going to get manipulatives for math uh, in elementary school? Is that something that is going to occur? So actually, Ms. Foxby is putting together a plan for distribution of materials on the middle school level. Um, that will include access to um, some of the books as well. Um, all, a lot of the books, particularly in math, science, and social studies, are avail available digitally. So we're encouraging you know, our, our parents and families to take advantage of that. But we do have hard copies of those texts available for those that request an actual hard copy. So she will be providing that information in reference to distribution of not only books, but other materials as well um, on a K-8 level. Great, great, thank you. You're welcome. 
Did we lose Dr. Zavajancic? No, we're switching it back again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, have a, I have a question for him. Um, the next, oh, James, you're ready. Okay. Um, the question, there's a question in the chat about assessment. It, are, you know, the, the statewide and standardized assessments, are they going to be occurring this year? And if so, how is that going to work for the students who have opted to do full remote? Sure. So our um, our students who have opted for the remote academy um, are still Fairfield students, and we would um, continue our curriculum and our assessment um, strategies with them. Um, the particular question about standardized assessments, those that we generally give as part of our uh, district, we are putting off for a little while. To Ms. Roxby's point earlier in the webinar, um, we want to make sure we focus on reconnecting kids to school, uh, worrying about social, social and emotional well-being and uh, connection to peers and teachers. And then we're going to um, begin looking at some of the standardized um, measures that we may use in the future, um, but definitely not at least within the first month um, or six weeks of school. Um, the state assessments, which in K-5 would be the Smarter Balanced Assessments and possibly the uh, Science Assessment um, in fourth grade, we, we are bound to give to all students. Um, so at this point, the state has uh, decided that they are still happening. We don't know what will happen, obviously, in the next few weeks with that decision uh, or months down the road when we get to the spring testing time, which usually occurs between April and May. Um, so, but as of right now, we would expect students to take those assessments regardless of the scenario they are in. Thank you. So back to questions surrounding dates. Can we confirm what the start date of school is, please, for students in the RLA? Nope. I Sorry, I, I didn't know if somebody was jumping in. So the uh, start day is um, sep Tuesday, September um, 8th. Um, Mrs. Roxby is going to um, plan to send stuff out there um, and realize that orientation is gonna be a big part of that, those first few days and weeks there, and week I should say there. Um, and then the next question about timing is what has, has anything changed in terms of students moving back and forth between the, the hybrid and the full remote? What is that process going to look like going forward? And Dr. Parrish, I see you unmuting yourself to take that one. So yes, at this time, um, we, we asked parents to give us uh -oh. <laughs> yes, we asked parents, I was too still. Uh, we asked parents to give us a 10 day and 10 instructional day window to make those transitions. Um, as was noted in Mr. Cummings um, uh, notice that went out, we are holding right now off on any changes. However, if you do need to make a change, it's imperative that you contact your child's actual host principal, or if you're in the remote academy or everyone on this call is on the remote academy, you can also um, contact Ms. Roxby. And once that window reopens, which is on September 10th, then we will be able to make changes, but it could take up to 10 instructional days for that change to be in effect. And the reason for that is we have to um, balance the cohorts of those students that are actually in the hybrid. And then in addition to that, um, if there is transportation needed, be able to uh, rework the transportation routes so that we can accommodate the, um, the, the students that are switching from remote into hybrid. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Mr. Mancusi, can you tell us when you think that special education services for students with IEPs will be able to start? We're looking for IEP services to start next week. Thank you. Um, if a student is, needs to miss part of the day, is their lesson going to be recorded for them to access later? I don't know if Dr. Zavajansk, if you want to tackle that one. Well, so when we talked a little bit about the schedules before, um, many, many of the lessons are um, dynamic in terms of whole, small, whole, or whole, small, independent um, for many of the disciplines. So, um, you know, the simple answer I would say is, is no, because we wouldn't record a small group, especially if that student who's absent isn't part of that small group, it wouldn't be beneficial necessarily for them. Um, 
So, you know, our expectation obviously is that students um, are coming to school uh, at our virtual academy. If there's a need for an absence, the teacher would um, work with that student like they would in a typical day to provide both the lesson or the work. Um, and remember, um, we said that there's some time built into the day where a teacher can um, have some independent time with the student if necessary to catch them up. Thank you. Don't mute yourself because I have another one for you. Um, the question is, how aligned is the curriculum between the hybrid model and the remote learning academy? So the um, if you if you do a quick comparison, pulling up the schedules from the remote academy to the hybrid, you should see that the same courses are covered um, for the most part. In the in the hybrid model, um, reading and writing are combined, whereas in the remote academy, um, they are separated. Uh, with that being said, there is uh, an, sort of an hour of instruction for reading and writing that is face-to-face -face, um, and in the remote academy, although it looks like more, there's a bit more time for um, rotations of groups. In regard to the curriculum, we expect our remote learning teachers as well as our hybrid teachers to be following the board approved curriculum in all of the subjects. Although that may look a little bit different in terms of activities that we're able to do in virtual as well as hybrid, there's some constraints on uh, the curriculum and the end results and uh, the products of it should be I identical um, for the most part in what we're asking kids to do. Is there a breakdown of numbers of students in a class? And I wonder if this might go to Dr. Parrish that people are wondering how big these classes are. So it depends on the level, on the middle school level, the class size ranges from about, well, it, it also depends on the class. So for example, a reading class um, would maintain the normal size that it would in, in the hybrid um, under the hybrid model. Um, so that would be about 10 to 12 students, whereas the typical regular class would be about 20, 24 to 25 students. On the K-5 level, um, the maximum size, again, is dictated by the grade level. So in grades K through two, um, the maximum size for those classes are 23, and then it's 25 on the three to five level. Okay. Um, so there is one, there's just a, a continuing question still in the comments that I think that as we're wrapping up here, we could answer one more time. And that is how much of this instruction is going to be live? Um, is it going to be like it was in the spring? And some people might've missed the answer at the, the beginning of the webinar for this one, but is instruction going to be live or is it, or assignments simply going to be posted for students to complete? Um, and Dr. Zavajancic, I see you unmuting yourself to answer that one. Mute. Um, so the instruction is certainly going to be live. I can't give you a definitive number because the groups in the rotations within each of the subjects is going to be different for every student. You can count on reading, writing, and math having a live session every single day um, between 15, 10, 15, or 20 minutes, followed by small groups after that. And you may have that two or three times a week or uh, three times a week or four times a week. It really depends on the need at that point. So I can't give you a, a full number, but you can uh, count on live instruction every single day. Thank you. There's if I could just part. jump in on that for a moment. You certainly Some can. From a special ed perspective, um, all our, our learning plans, 50, we have a 50-50 synchronous asynchronous model. So all special ed services should be delivered at least 50% in this case on um, live video. Thank you. Um, there's a repeated question in the comments about, what about parents who are working with a job are they expected to quit their job in order to support their student who is engaged in distance learning and i don't know who wants to take that one uh i'll take it uh the answer okay. is no no they're not expected to, to quit their job i mean obviously depending on the age of the child the child being home parents are going to arrange for the appropriate child care coverage um, I would expect just like a student who's in brick and mortar, a student who's in, you know, five day a week instruction during the course of the school year, students are going to be 
looking for parental support on different assignments and, and different help. And, uh, um, you know, every parent on this phone call knows that it, how important it is to ask their child how the day went. But no, it, nobody should be having to sit by their child throughout the learning period. Um, and if that's the case, um, then you, you, you can contact any of us or contact Mr. Roxby uh, with that concern. Great, thank you. Um, okay, I don't see any new questions that are related directly to the RLA. I will say that I, I am seeing some frustration in the chat that we're not addressing things like um the buildings and the preparation of the buildings themselves at this point um and that was not the design of this specific webinar so um that is why those questions are not being addressed at this time this was to address the remote learning that is in place for students grades k through eight um and for the second half of the webinar we'll be addressing the secondary school um, so i apologize if there was any confusion about what the the questions we were going to be answering tonight if there are other questions on other topics, any one of us on this screen are available to answer them um, outside of this webinar. Colleen, I, I have to say, because I know we got a couple minutes before the high school starts. So, mm -hmm. so let me kind of address that maybe, uh, I'm sure this will be probably too broad for some of the specific questions, but um, what I said at the beginning about uh, remote learning is really also true about the hybrid, students in the hybrid. Um, we, our primary emphasis is uh, on the safety and well-being of the students and the staff. And we're doing everything we can to make that happen. We, we spent this week on that. I have no doubt that when uh, the students return in full on Tuesday into the brick and mortar, um, that we're, some of the things that we're concerned about are going to go away, but other things that we hadn't thought about are going to pop up. Um, the, uh, most important thing is that the students are back in the building and we continue to learn. Um, you know, the, we're following the social distancing guidelines. We're following the masks. Uh, we're putting in additional PPE in the spaces where it's needed. Um, we're going to be following all the cleaning protocols throughout the day. All these things are happening um, and will continue to happen. And the, the principals and the teachers will be working to modify arrangements, protocols, everything as we kind of live through the day. So, um, you know, I, I'm telling the teachers and I, I will, the teachers need, have, will hear from me, they've heard from me, they'll continue to hear from me. They, their primary need in the first couple of weeks is to make sure that everybody is safe and following the rules. And we will, you know, instruction will evolve out of that, but it's only gonna come when people feel safe. So our teachers are, um, are very concerned about the safety and welfare and we are following them. Um, they want to, they always want to do right by the students and, and um, I have full faith in what they're going to do to, to support the kids uh, to get through this year. Thank you. So we do have a few minutes um, and I still don't see any questions here? There, there, there are still some existing questions, Ms. Roxby and and Dr. Zavajancic about the the timing and how people are going to find out about when orientation is, what the schedule of the day is. So, is there a specific place that you can point people to on the website that they can access this? Um, I think if you wait until after tomorrow, we'll have lots more information about the orientation um, and we will communicate that through your classroom teachers and we can also pl place it on the district website when the orientation will be. Um, I didn't want to make the decision for an orientation without input from the staff because I, I am very collaborative in my work and I feel like it's very important to have input from the teachers on when that would be and what it would look like so that we can provide the best opportunity for, for them to communicate with you what's happening, but also to communicate um, to each other about uh, things that they can do collaboratively so that everyone is on the same page. So we really have to work all of that out. And um, if you give us one more day, I promise that you'll have some more information um, by Tuesday about when orientation will be and what it will look like. So thank you for your patience as we as we finally get together as a school tomorrow and, and collaborate together. And one last question for you, Ms. Roxby. When is the technology pickup scheduled to be? 
It is actually tomorrow. If you have not uh, received your, your uh, computer yet, tomorrow between 8 and 4 here at 501 Kings Highway um, on the second floor in the boardroom, you can come and uh, pick up your computer. So um, if you have not done so, please do that um, because we're going to be hitting the road on Tuesday. I will just say that that's for students whose parents identified on the survey that they were in need of a device. Um, in the event you did not indicate that need on the survey, if you can please send Ms. Roxby an email so that we can start to quantify um, the, the, which, which students and which families need devices, um, because that information will be important as we start to assess our uh, remaining inventories and, and be able to then do a second wave of distribution. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So one last question for you, Mr. Cummings, before we do move on to secondary. Um, if we go into full distance learning at some point this year, the way we did in the spring, will the RLA continue um, or will students go back to their home schools? I think some people might have missed that as well. Yeah, no, the RLA will continue. The um, In order to staff the school, the RLA, with um, the staff that we wanted in place, we had to take students out of the class list and collapse some of the sections at the elementary schools. So those students are going to stay in the RLA uh, classrooms throughout the year if, they, if they're making a decision to stay in RLA. They'll be staying in those classrooms throughout the year. Thank you. Okay. Are we ready for the second half? Yes. Okay. So, uh, Andrew, do you want to bring that back up? All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Mike Cummings, uh, superintendent of schools here in Fairfield. And if you're joining us now, uh, the purpose of tonight's conversation is to have discussion about the Remote Learning Academy for the high school. Uh, I'm joined tonight by uh, Dr. Sakia Parrish, our executive director of operations and processes, Colleen DC, our executive director of um, human resources, uh, Dr. James Sav excuse me, James Savachancic, our director of instruction curriculum assessment. Uh, Rob Mancusi, who is our executive director of special education. And we're going to address those uh, questions in a minute. I just want to take a couple minutes and go over some important points and um, uh, that uh, before we get started, kind of themes of the evening, as it were. So the first thing is that, um, as we've hopefully demonstrated to you over the past couple of weeks, um, we are going to continue to listen and keep improving the model that we're um, that we're implementing in terms of the Remote Learning Academy. But also this bullet point and the ones that follow are equally as applicable to the hybrid learning model as well. We are really um, you know, doing our best to hear what people need and to respond as much as we can to that, um, to those needs. So to that point, we are all first year educators at this, just as you are first time parents in this. Uh, again, whether you're in hybrid or remote, We've never begun a school year like this before. There are things we know and we can anticipate, and there are things that we cannot anticipate and know. So um, with this comes, please, a request for patience from everybody as we move forward. Um, we are prioritizing the social and emotional uh, well-being and health of our students and staff. That is going to be the work, really, of the, at least the first couple of weeks of school um, as we build relationships um, during the course of the school year. Our teachers are on a steep learning curve. Um, they're, while they engaged in remote learning in the spring, our students did as well, obviously. Um, we have heard you, as we've said before, we've heard you about what those concerns were, and we've set out over the course of the summer to improve that. Uh, but there is going to be learning along the way as we go through this. So again, patience being the operative word as our teachers work really hard to improve their instruction in response to what we've learned. And finally, uh, our, just to reemphasize a point from last, the last uh, message sent home, the learning model changes are on hold until September 10th, and we will be following up next week with more information about that. So with that said, 
High School uh, Remote Learning Academy. So the schedules are now posted in Infinite Campus. These are the schedules that students received uh, for the courses they selected back in the spring. Direct instruction is going to be through live Google Meet. Um, students will be able to join on either the Monday, Thursday group or the Tuesday, Friday lesson, the hybrid lesson, or both, if they so choose, if they find it to their advantage to listen to a lesson twice. And sometimes, it's, I mean, I can certainly speak for my own needs sometimes to do that. Um, it's going to be, they'll be able to join in on both days if they need to, and as well as they'll be attending on Wednesday. Uh, it's really important. I want to emphasize that second bullet point uh, and broaden it a little bit. Students in Remote Learning Academy are expected to be in attendance, and attendance is going to be taken. So uh, it's really important that, that students are marked by the teacher for having been uh, in class. Um, Google Meet lessons uh, will be recorded and uh, posted in Google Classroom, and I want to put a couple parameters around that. It is not our intention for, um, for students to, if, if they're, in, if they're um, videoing to the class, uh, participating virtually in the class, um, they they obviously may want to look at recorded portions of the lesson later uh, in order to refresh their memory or to get directions straight or something like that. But we're not going to necessarily record the entire 80 minutes of every lesson. It's We've talked to our teachers and it's really important that their emphasis be on explanation and directions, the delivery of content, um, and other things like that. It's not going to necessarily be helpful for a student to go back and review a lesson where there's class discussions and other things going on that they may not be able to even hear or take part in. So we're really emphasizing, at least to start the year, that the teachers um, provide the students with the direct instruction that they require. And um, the teachers will be offering synchronous hours, office hours for student support. Um, one of the things that we're working on and we have to be cautious about um, is a couple of things with um, the technology as well as instructional soundness. So as I said at the first slide here, uh, our teachers are working off a learning curve as, and our technology is working off a learning curve. We are working through the Google Meet format to start the year. Um, we expect that we're gonna have, probably have to deal with some issues around sound quality at times, depending on certain spaces, instructional spaces. Um, so we're gonna work through those issues. And the other thing we're gonna work on is, um, is working on supporting teachers working in this instructional model. It's um, going to be different for them, different than the remote learning, strict remote learning. Um, and so we're going to continue to provide teachers with uh, uh, instructional support as they learn this model. So for questions and answers, Ms. DC is going to moderate again this evening and, and she'll uh, look at the questions and farm them out to each of us tonight. Mr. Cummings, does this mean that the academic center's model is no longer being put forward? That's correct. We've replaced that now because the teachers, the, excuse me, the students will have direct access to their teachers in the classroom. There's a question that it asks, have you hired a dedicated IT person? We have multiple hired dedicated IT teachers, uh, excuse me, staff. Yes. And, and related to that, there are questions about IC currently being down. We, we do have confirmation that it is down and I don't think that we currently have an estimated time that it will be back up, but I wonder if Dr. Parrish has more up-to-date information than I do. No, I do not. I did get confirmation that it's down, it's down for a, a, an update and uh, they do anticipate it being restored shortly. Thank you. Thank you. And once again, we have questions about the timing of the school day. Um, we need to know these these practical logistics before we can get into the other stuff, it seems. So what is the school day going to look like for students? How often do they need to be on their computer? Um, I think that there are some, um, like I said, logistical questions that folks are wondering. So the, the school day on a high school is the normal school day. They would follow, you know, the start times of their normal classes. In terms of length of time they need to be on their computer, because the entire period is not spent um, engaging in direct instruction, there's not a need for a student to, to have their computer up the entire length of the block. Um, that's really up to that student and what they feel comfortable with. Um, at some point in time, there'll be a uh, 
opportunities or segments of the lesson in which the teacher will, you know, release students to do some independent work. And so at that time, you know, we would expect that, you know, students will, as necessary, either, you know, log out of the Google Meet session or they are, you know, they are welcome to stay on if it's something that um, requires them to, or not requires, but that allows them to continue being a part of that Google Meet. But it's not an expectation that they'll be, um, 85 minutes of direct instruction lectures type of situation. And so what that does is it provides the students an opportunity to receive that direct instruction live, but because that lesson is going to be um, recorded and uploaded to Google Classroom, if they miss something or just needed to get something reinforced, they could always access that recorded lesson in order to uh, review what it is that they might have missed. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. So um, a, a somewhat related question, how is attendance taken for the students and is there a specific time that they need to be logged into every class? Yes, they, they do need to be there for the start of the class. So it's, it's the class is starting like it would if they were physically in the building. And so they would need to be in their class ready to go um, at the start of the class so that the teacher um, could uh, can take attendance and mark them as present. Um, at, so they, you know, in terms of the length of time, it will vary from one lesson to the next, but they do need to be there for the start of the class. And then uh, Dr. Parrish and Dr. Zavajancic, can both of you perhaps walk us through, if I'm, a, if I'm a remote student learning at home, how do I get linked into the class itself? Can I ask, like, how linked in am I? Can I ask questions? Will I be interacting with my classmates? What does that look like for me? Or am I simply viewing something on a screen? So um, it will be an opportunity for them to utilize the chat to ask questions of their teacher, but not necessarily participate in, in class discussions with the cohort that's present in the room itself. Um, it, ver it, just, it will vary depending on the lesson itself as to whether or not um, the teacher is engaging them in some sort of breakout groups where they have, you know, a, a discussion with members of the in-person cohort, you know, virtually. Um, that's that's something that the teachers have the option of doing, um, but there's not a set amount of time or set a, a designated length of of a class period that they're expected to do that. It's it's at, as they see fit based on the nature of the lesson. Dr. Zavajancic, would you want to add anything to that? No, I think Dr. Parrish covered it. Thank you. Great. So I have a question for you. <laughs> Can you talk to us about music, please? Sure. What is so, music um, going to look like at the high school level? Yes. Yep. So, um, music is um, going to happen, um, like the other classes are happening. Um, there's multiple different guidance documents and um, um, stipulations that we have to put in place to keep children safe in the music class. Uh, specifically, there has to be a nine by six space between choral singers, a twelve foot space between um, wind instrumentalists. Uh, everybody has to wear masks, obviously, and face in the same direction. Uh, the teacher will continue facing the students to lead a lot of those performing uh, arts classes. They will have uh, PPE and protective plexiglass in front of them. Um, the typical classroom that music takes place in may not occur. Uh, we've identified other larger areas within each of the secondary buildings that music might happen. Some of those might be the auditorium um, or, or a uh, stage in a gym. Um, we, you know, the, the high school and the middle school, we, we do have some options for lessons to happen remotely uh, on days that students are remote. So there's there's that um, way to do music as well when we're not actually in the classroom. Um, there's other little things that are in place. Uh, there, you know, instruments have to be covered um, so that the aerosols aren't being spread about. Um, we have to make sure that we're teaching 30 minutes followed by 20 minutes of no teaching or theory um, to allow the air in the room to be diluted and recycled by our HVAC systems. Um, so there's a number of precautions that we have to take for music that we obviously don't have to take for other um, areas, but you know we're doing them to keep students and staff safe um, in our classrooms. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Zavajancic, before, oh, you muted, but I'm still gonna call on you again. 
Can you talk to us a bit about what grading is going to look like under this model? Is there going to be any change to the summative, formulative grading that we had last year? Is that going to look different? Can you walk us through that a bit? Sure. So, I mean, I'll start and I'll ask Dr. Parrish. She might have more um, knowledge in the specifics of it. Um, the grading uh, standards haven't changed at this point. Students will um, take assessments. They'll be formative and summative in nature. Um, they'll be at the um, end of course requirements. Um, they'll be end of unit uh, um, performance tasks or assignments, uh, projects, uh, essays, and papers. None of that will will change the mode that we do that might change. They might be more computer directed um, versus paper and pencil, but um, all of those things are gonna continue to take place uh, in the 2021 school year uh, at the secondary level. And I'll just add to that, you know, one of the things our program directors have been working with teachers on, and not just currently, but for a while, is the use of more frequent, smaller assessments that will be able to measure a student's progress. So. Um, those types of types of uh, types of assessments can be given um, over the course of you know a, a, a unit within a unit multiple assessments. So it's not just limited to our traditional end a unit large scale test. Um, there are opportunities for smaller assessments to be um, provided for students in order to measure their um, proficiency on some of the content standards. Thank you. Um, Dr. Parrish, can you also talk to us a bit about the technology that's being distributed to students? If students are in a specific course that requires them to have a version of Adobe or something like that for a tech course, or if they need physical materials, how will that be distributed? Will it be distributed and what will that look like? So some of the technology in terms of software will be available via class links. There are some specialty, you know, versions of software that, um, might not necessarily be accessible through that. And so there will have to be modifications in terms of what they would and would not have access to in order to be able to successfully um, complete certain parts of courses. In terms of materials, um, the material distribution for our remote students is being handled at the school level. And so the um, headmasters have created opera or creating opportunities for some of those materials, including textbooks and things like that to be picked up um, on site. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Mancusi, we haven't called on you in a while. Would you be able to walk us through what the special education model is going to look like at the high school level? Hi, Mancusi. Um, service, the services will be delivered um, according to the student schedule and the student services listed in the IEP. We're still required to um, implement IEPs at this time. So 50% of students' services um, in special education, a minimum of 50% will be delivered through live video um, and 50% will be posted activities on Google Classroom. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Cummings, I have a question for you. Can you confirm that this model is different from the model that we have for the elementary and the middle school grades? Yes, it is different. The, uh, in this model, the students remain in their chosen classes. Um, in the elementary and middle, we are pulling out uh, essentially those students and they're going to be in really a complementary school or set of classes to the classes that exist in the brick and mortar buildings. Thank you. And then we do have another question and I, I would think this one would go to Dr. Parrish, but you can um, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Parrish. If a student has um, something on their, an elective on their schedule, like a cooking class or an art class, are they still gonna participate in that class remotely? Yes. So all classes are running. The model for high school is different than the model for K-8. Um, the high school model or the, the model that we're following, the students are still enrolled in the classes that they were scheduled in um, as a result of the process they went through in the spring to select courses. So they would continue in those courses um, as scheduled. Great, great. Um, when will people be able to get the Google Classroom codes? So that would come from their teachers. So the teachers would send them a, a invite, basically inviting them to join their Google Classrooms. 
Is there a deadline for that? So it would need to happen prior to the start of school so that the kids know um, what, what, when to log in or where to log in, excuse me. Great. So that's so something need- teachers are working on, you know, that they're still trying to plan out and set up their Google Classroom. So they, they should be expecting um, emails to come tr- basically over the course of the next few days. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And Mr. Cummings, back to you. I have a follow up to sort of the, the difference between the two models. And that is if under this model, if we go back to full distance, what is going to happen to the, these students? If we go back into full distance, they'd be, they're essentially going to be relatively little difference. They're going to be those classes, the, the hybrid schedule would go essentially go away. Um, the, the classes would follow um, a, re, a remote learning schedule at the high school. Um, I, I don't know if it'll be similar to last year's or look slightly different, but, and then the students would just be part of those classes full time. Great. And if a student wants to switch between the two models, what would that look like? Perhaps Dr. Parrish, you would want to take that one? So it would be similar to what we described for the other, um, for, for K-8. So if they're trying to go from remote into hybrid, we still would need the, the 10 instructional days again to balance the A-B cohorts and to uh, provide any um, bus transportation that's necessary. But their schedule, in, in essence, would remain the same. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I'm going to pause and wait and see if the chat catches up to me. Um, so there is there's a question between what the two cohorts will do is there a co- for you have cohort a and cohort b are they going to be doing the same thing on the different on different days or are they going to be doing different things on each day are you referring to the hybrid cohorts or because there are no cohorts for remote right so if remote students are participating in a specific cohort does that matter for them I think that that's the question. Okay, no. So cohort A and B will basically be doing the uh, the same lesson. So um, what teachers do for kids that are in class on you know on a Monday will be similar, if not the identical to what's happening um, in their class on a Tuesday. So there'll be some variations to that depending on the nature of who's in the room and what the needs of the students are. But uh, for the most part that will be what is expected um, across the board initially. So are students in the RLA, are they participating three days a week or are they participating five days a week? So they would be participating three days a week. They have the opportunity to join up to five. So if, like I said, if they um, sat in on a class on Monday and for some reason, didn't quite get it, and and they're um, still you know still need to have that reinforced. They they're able to redo that same lesson in essence um, that very next day, but it wouldn't be as though they're getting additional instruction um, beyond what is being provided to the students in hybrid. Thank you, and and Dr. Parrish and uh oh, <laughs> you're too still again, mm-hmm. and Mr. Cummings. Perhaps you can uh, both talk to us a little bit about. Where are we with technology now for this in the classroom and where are we hoping to be with technology in the classroom? Uh, where we are right now, we are reliant on the Google Meet um, format for this um, and we're going to be, uh, teachers will have, through that, teachers, uh, excuse me, students will have access to the uh, materials in the classroom, Google Classroom. Um, depending on how this goes, we're, we may be staying there um, we may have to um, in, improve the sound quality. I think that's our greatest concern right now, the quality of sound that we're going to be able to capture in the classroom. Um, so we're going to see. We're going to see where we have to go to improve it. Uh, but that's where we're starting. Thank you. Okay. Um, so there's a, there's a repeated question in the comments about, do the students who are in the RLA have more opportunities for synchronous learning than the students who are in hybrid? Uh, and I think Dr. Parrish or Dr. Zavijancic, you might be able to to tackle that one. So the answer to that would be no. It would be I. So the because the lesson is being retaught, uh, I guess you technically could call that an additional opportunity for synchronous learning. But it would be the exact same lesson that was taught previously. So, um, and I, I guess I don't see that as an additional opportunity, but maybe an additional exposure. 
to the same material. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and and the the question again comes up about after school activities. Are students in the RLA able to participate in after school activities or sports? So at this time, uh, the the answer is no for that. Um, we will continue to reevaluate the situation as the year progresses. But at this point in time, uh, those that are in the remote um, learning model for high school will also not be able to participate. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do students have to attend Google Meets at all if it's just going to be recorded? Yes. <laughs> You were about to say something, Mr. Cummings? Yeah, I, I just would say I think that that would be very unfortunate. Yeah. Um, because they're going to be missing out. Um, you know, again, I want to go back and say that we're not looking to record the whole 80 minutes and have students listen to it. I don't think that would be of great benefit educationally for students. Students, you know, I'll go back to the whole reason that we, we heard what we heard from parents and what changed in the model was for students to actively participate in class. Now, I recognize that. There'll be schedule issues and different things that could come up in a child's life that may prevent um, them being able to be part of the class every day. Uh, things will come up, obviously, but um, for a student to just um, think that they're going to get the educational experience by listening to a recording, uh, it won't. It won't. It will not be or the rich educational experience that they get from actually actively participating in the class. Um. Do remote learners need to participate in contact tracing at all? Do they need to participate in contact tracing? Yeah, yeah. For the uh, purposes of education. Uh, there won't be physical contact, so there wouldn't be a need for them to be a part of the contact tracing protocol. Um, this that, That's primarily if you have physical contact with someone, um, which those that are remote would not. What will a day on Wednesday look like? Will it look like it has a class schedule like the other four days of the week, or will it be something different? So it will look very different. So on Wednesdays, um, that's an opportunity for the teachers to bring the entire group together. So that's that's a time when teachers are able to bring those students that are in remote for both, or for I'm sorry, are in hybrid both cohorts, as well as the students who are, are working remotely together um, to have conversations that, you know, maybe they're splitting them up and doing, um, allowing them opportunities to work on things as a group. Maybe they're giving feedback to that group on some of the things that they're working on when they're working independently remotely. Um, so there, there is a schedule for Wednesdays, but it is all eight periods. So they would see all eight of their teachers on that day and the periods would be very, would be shortened. So they would be about 40, 45 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a repeated question of what about the other two days of the week? Those students not going into a class. What are they, what are they doing on those days? So just like the students that are in the hybrid learning model, those are the, those are the days for them to work asyn asyn asynchronously, excuse me. Um, so they're working on assignments that the teacher has posted in Google Classroom. They might actually be meeting as a group virtually to work on a, a project or some sort of task that's been assigned by the teacher. Um, but there, there isn't um, an expectation that they would have additional learning opportunities beyond what um, they would have on the day that they actually log into the class via Google Meet. Thank you. Um, and so attendance is not going to be taken for those students on those two days a week. Is that correct? So it would be the same as it would be for the hybrid students um, in terms of their attendance. Thank you. And waiting for the chat to catch up. We are we are out of questions for now, but there was one um, that came up a little while ago, and perhaps Mr. Mancusi can walk us through that. Can you talk us through, Mr. Mancusi, how students are going to connect with their school counselors if they are in the RLA? It, it's a little bit different at the high school level. Like the the students are being um, served, students with disabilities are being serviced by. Um, the high school special education and related service staff. So depending on who the student service provider is 
or the, the student's schedule is, there will be scheduled times for students to receive their special education instruction as well as their speech, OT, PT, or counseling services. And that will be done through Google Meets or through um, activities posted onto Google Classroom to support goals and objectives. Colleen, I, I just want to follow up on that because I, I'm wondering if the question also, to follow up on what Mr. McCusey said, I wonder if that question also has to do with um, guidance counselor staff and students in remote learning will be able to essentially contact and set up, uh, you know, live meets with their guidance counselor staff, if they, you know, talking about um, college and all those types of other things that might involve um, th those, it might invite those conversations. Thank you. Um, I, have a, I do have a question for Dr. Zavajancic. I believe it's for you. Um, what about AP classes? How are students going to get through all of that uh, curriculum if they're in the RLA? So the AP classes are still running um, throughout the year. We get that they are um, more um, considered some of our more rigorous courses. Um, and, and, you know, there's a test at the end of the year. Um, there is still um, on site as well as remote learning with it. And uh, the teachers are planning to get through the curriculums that were submitted to the uh, college board um, for the AP classes. Thank you. Um, there is There are several questions in the chat about why students who are in the RLA are not expected to participate in sports and people are looking for the reasoning behind that. So, Mr. Cummings, I don't know if you want to take that one. Yeah, this is a well, this is a, um, an issue we're going to re-examine, but the issue right now, the concern for us right now is the cohort issue of, um, you know, essentially students who are not in school um, and trying to maintain the cohort status against those students who are in school. Um, but it is something we are going to continue to look at. Thank you. Okay. Um, a lot of the questions that are in the chat right now are about schedule, about three versus five days a week. It is stuff that we have answered already. So I would I would like to avoid repeating ourselves if there are new questions we can answer. Um, Um, a lot of this we we have answered in terms of schedule when we start taking attendance. Um, so high school classes will be recorded. Is that different from the elementary or middle school model? Are they going to be recorded at the elementary or middle? I don't understand that question. I'm sorry. Are elementary and middle school classes going to be recorded at in hybrid to share out? Oh, that that was not a part of the model for for middle schools. Um, it was primarily for uh, the high schools because of the fact that um, they're still enrolled in their current schedules, and we understand that there may be times in which they. Um, miss something need to go back and review something whereas in the and i won't even just say middle but also the k-8 model they're actually interacting with their teacher um on a on a on a regular basis on a daily basis through uh google meet so it's a little bit of a different setup uh, because of the fact that they are um not they don't have that same opportunity to interact uh, with their live teacher every day Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mancusi, how will a student with services on their IP, like push in services from a teacher or peer support, how will that translate to students who are who are in the RLA? That's a good question. And there's a couple a couple parts to that answer. If students are participating in a collab class or a co-talk class, they will be able to participate in that co-talk class remotely. Um, for students who have para support on their IEPs, um, or if if they have a, a certain um, service on their IEP, we're, it's going to require us to complete something 
that's called the learning model IEP implementation plan, which gives districts the opportunity to um, revise the way in which IEP goals and objectives or services are delivered. And it's going to require us to adjust our service delivery model because IEPs are written as if students are in school full time and services are delivered live and in person. So special education teams and parents are going to be required to fill out the learning model IEP implementation plan and to make decisions on the most appropriate ways to address and uh, implement goals and objectives and services um, within a remote learning model. Thank you. Um, Mr. Cummings, or perhaps Dr. Parrish, when uh, will students find out when the office hours are for teachers? When will they find out their schedule and what they're supposed to be doing? How will all of that information be disseminated? Um, well, the schedule should be in it for the campus already. Um, that was, again, there's been really no change in the schedules from the schedules that were distributed uh, at the high school. Uh, office hours, I'm sure, will be communicated by the teachers. Thank you. Um, there's someone asking why we are not doing synchronous learning. Is it an IET issue and what is the downside? I don't know if Mr. Cummings, you want to tackle that one? Yeah. Um, by synchronous learning, I'm assuming that the that is that um, uh, the instruction would be going on for the length of the period. Students who are remoting in are essentially going to be having synchronous instruction with the classroom. It's if they're remoting into the classroom um, while there are students in their desks, they're going to be part of that class. So um, while we are recording portions of the lesson mainly as a resource for students who either cannot attend or attended and need to uh, review the material. Um, students who are home and come into the class through their computer virtually are engaging in synchronous instruction. Thank you. Um, so there remains confusion in the chat and perhaps we can clear this up now that we're coming to the end of our session. Students who are in the RLA for high school are expected to attend virtually how many days a week? Dr. Parrish? So similar to the hybrid students where they're coming into a class, that particular class, they would come in twice a week. So if I have chemistry period one, I would come into chemistry on Monday or on Tuesday, but I would also have to come there on Wednesday. Oh, okay. So I wouldn't be actually uh, dialing into the Google Meets necessarily on Tuesday, um, but I would be then on that day accessing the remote activity that the teacher has set up for me, for, for both me, as well as the students that are in hybrid, but are working remotely that day to work on. And so that's Thank what you. I would be doing. You're welcome. Thank you. So, uh, Mr. Cummings, the follow up or clarification to the question I just asked you. Um, the question was not synchronous for the students in RLA. It was, why are we not doing five days of synchronous for the students in hybrid as well? So that person's question was, specifically geared towards all okay. students. I don't know if you want to take that. Yeah, uh, that really goes back to the question. You know, we've received that question before and the answer really remains the same. Um, we are not ruling out that possibility, uh, but we have to, um, we have, as I said at the beginning, we have concerns about um, getting our teachers, uh, giving our teachers time to grow into what this, this new instructional model is. And we want to be able to make sure that uh, the commitment we're making to this will be supported by the technology infrastructure to, to make it happen. So, um, you know, I've had conversations with our headmasters. Our headmasters have had conversations with the teachers. I know that there's some interest in doing this, um, but we're going to make sure that everything works before we go and commit to that level of instruction. Okay. And now, Dr. Parrish, I come back to you with another clarification. Um, people want to know if they can go on either day. How do they know when they're supposed to go and when they're being expected? 
how are, is there an expectation of someone's in cohort A and that's the day that they're supposed to go and have attendance taken, or is it really fluid that people are switching back and forth? So the days might be set by the teacher. Um, you know, they might decide that they want to evenly split the remote students. Uh, we're gonna leave that up to teacher discretion or working with the students to be able to do that. Um, so it, there isn't a set day for the remote students like there is for the cohort A and B. Um, so I think that it really depends on the nature of what the teacher sees is the most beneficial for that particular class and that particular lesson. And that would be communicated to the students in terms of when they should or should not need to log in for a particular class. Thank you. Okay. Is it necessary for a parent to call a student out sick if they are sick and going to be absent from distance learning that day? Well, attendance is being taken, so they would be marked absent. So it would be helpful to, for, for the teacher to know um, and the school to know that they are sick so that they're able to mark them accordingly. Because students, even though we're, we're saying they're remote, they are still a part of their high school community. Thank you. Um, and so what are, what are the next steps from here? Okay, if we could reiterate for perhaps for people who weren't on at the the 45 minute mark before. Um, what are the next steps for orientation for this? What, um, how are we gonna get started next week? What is that gonna look like? So the next steps for us is, is really making sure that the communication happens in terms of the teachers being able to share um, those Google Classroom access codes so that students are able to um, to know where and when they are expected to uh, be a part of a particular class. And so a lot of the information that they're looking for will happen, will be provided by the classroom teacher. On the high school level, there is an orientation per se for grades 10 through 12. They have had orientations for grade nine, even for the students who are, um, the grade nine students who are working remotely. So there isn't an, a separate orientation for our grades 10 through 12 students because they are still a part of their school community. So we did, we're doing an orientation for the K-8 because of the fact that they're actually being um, virtually removed from their, um, their actual schools and placed into uh, a district-wide learning environment. Whereas on the high school level, that's not happening. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I, with that, Mr. Cummings, I don't know if you have any closing uh, remarks, but we do seem to be um, circling around the same sorts of questions in the chat at this point that we, we have answered. So really quickly, um, I thank you for everybody who's attending tonight. Uh, as I said at the beginning, and we'll continue to say, no doubt throughout the entire year, um, we're gonna be continuing to um, take feedback, continuing to improve, continuing to grow. Um, as I've said, uh, and, and again, we'll continue to say, um, patience is really going to be the operating word. We are fully committed to doing a great job, but there's a lot of learning that has to occur. Um, our teachers have done a tremendous amount of work already. They're going to be do a tremendous amount of work going forward. Um, and um, we will, um, I just ask that people um, uh, bear with us as we go through. It's, it certainly doesn't mean that we don't want to hear what you have to say. But be patient as we try to implement the changes because we are um, operating uh, across the board of a very large school system trying to get these things done. Thank you. Okay. Good night.